White Lion was a band that shined brightly for a few years before crashing and burning. In fact, some members would vanish into obscurity. Frontman Mike Tramp would perfectly summarize the band's career to louder sound, saying, The rise of White Lion was like climbing a ladder with a rocket up your ass. And today, we're going to talk about the history of the band White Lion. White Lion came up during a time when hair metal dominated the rock scene. And while a lot of these bands had origins in Los Angeles or within California, White Lion didn't follow the same formula. Part Danish and American, the band formed in New York City. The group would be led by Danish singer Mike Tramp, who prior to forming White Lion, was in a band named Mabel back home, which played teeny bopper music. And soon enough, Mabel found a lot of success in Denmark and Spain. In fact, the band would represent Denmark at the 1978 Eurovision Song Contest, but they would finish 16th out of 20 competing teams. The band would eventually move to Spain, and it was during this time Tramp grew tired of the band's pop-friendly sound and wanted to refine their sound to be more like Van Halen and ACDC, bands which had a big impact on Tramp. After changing their sound, Mabel would become the studs. Hoping to grow their popularity, the band moved to America in the 80s, where they underwent another name change, now going by the title Danish Lions. Sadly, they would fall flat in America, and the band's members would head back home to Europe, but Tramp opted to stay in the States. It was during Tramp's time in Danish Lions in America in 1982 that he met guitarist Vito Brada, who was on the same bill that night playing in a different band. But following the dissolution of Danish Lions, the pair assembled a band named White Lion. Despite their musical talent, it became apparent from the start that the two musicians had very different work ethics. Tramp would tell Louder Sound, I was the engine that made Vito move. Vito lived with his parents in Staten Island, and he never lifted a finger to make any money. If he drove to my place in Queens, I'd have to give him $10 for gas, he'd say. The pair quickly assembled a band. The group's future looked promising, as they would soon sign to Elektra Records. But the band hit a snag when the label was less than impressed with their debut album Fight to Survive and opted not to release it. Tramp would tell Louder Sound that he believed that Elektra had already signed Molly Crew and Doc into their label and White Lion Sound felt too similar. Elektra soon cut their losses and the band were quickly dropped. The band's manager though worked out a deal that saw the album only released in Japan. And soon enough the European press would shower their debut album with praise. And while the band struggled to land another record deal, they still had opportunities coming in. They would appear in the Steven Spielberg produced movie The Money Pit, which starred Tom Hanks, and they would appear as a fictional band in the film. Producer Peter Hawk reached out to the band in late 1986, inviting them to come to Germany to record their follow up album. Tramp would tell Louder Sound, We already had the title for the album, Pride, and we had some great new songs like Wait and Hungry, but something got lost in the recording. When we got back to New York and we played the finished album, we just knew it wasn't good enough, and at that point, we really didn't know what to do, he'd say. Ironically, it would be another German producer who rescued the band. Producer Michael Wagner was on a hot streak having worked as a producer and mixer on several high-profile groups' records, including Metallica, Molly Crew, and Dawkin. Wagner ended up hearing the music the band was working on in Germany and got in touch with White Lion's management and wanted to re-record the record. The band were on tour opening for Mannequin in Baltimore, and at that show was an A&R guy from Atlantic Records named Jason Flom, who was there to check out Mannequin. Tramp would reveal to Louder Sound that their manager got Flom so intoxicated at the show that he verbally agreed to sign White Lion, which they did. The band would assemble in California shortly after with Wagner to re-record Pride in just six weeks. The album would coincidentally enough be released on July 21st, 1987, the same day as one of the biggest selling albums of all time, Guns N' Roses' Appetite for Destruction. The album's first single, Wait, had a strange trajectory. Even though it was released on June 1st, 1987, it took seven months for the song to break big. It would only take off once MTV started playing the music video in January of 1988 that the song became a top 10 hit on the Billboard Hot 100 charts. A year after Pride came out, Atlantic released the second single, Tell Me, alongside a music video. That song would peak at number 58 on the charts, but it would be the album's third single, When the Children Cry, that catapulted Pride up the album charts as the song peaked at number 3. Along with heavy play on MTV, Pride became only one of 20 rock albums to have two or more songs chart in the top 10 on the Billboard Hot 100 charts. Shortly after, the record would peak at number 11, and it would stay on the charts for a full year. 
Also helping White Lion was that the group landed some high profile touring spots opening up for Aerosmith, ACDC, KISS, Striper and Ozzy Osbourne. With the success of Pride, guitarist Vito Brada soon became recognized for his guitar playing, racking up awards in several magazines. The band's music also seemed to attract a large female audience, with Tramp telling Louder Sound that ACDC's Brian Johnson told him, this is the first time we've seen a big amount of women in our audience. With the band riding high, they would soon come crashing down as they turned their attention to their third album. While there would be a number of factors that led to the band's decline following the success of Pride, Tramp would lay the blame at the relationship he had with guitarist Vito Brada, telling Louder Sound, Vito and I had no connection whatsoever except through music, it's sad but true. By the end of the tour to support Pride, the band members were now millionaires. There wasn't that sense of family in which they needed one another. And shortly after the tour for Pride ended, the band found themselves back in the studio with producer Michael Wagner in Hollywood, where they recorded Pride. Tramp immediately could feel how money and fame was changing the band's dynamic, saying in the same interview, On Pride, the parking lot was full of dirty old rentals. But now there were Corvettes and Harleys. The whole vibe was different. And outside of the studio, Vito and I were not spending any time together. Making matters worse was that the band was on a tight timeline. Even though they toured Pride for two years, months after getting off the road, they were booked to open for Ozzy and being offered a whopping $25,000 a night. The label wanted the band to have an album ready before those dates, and in August of 1989, the group would release their third record, Big Game, which went gold selling over 500,000 copies, well below the 2 million Pride had previously sold. Tramp would also reveal that the record label wasn't sure how to revive the band's career, and the tour to support the album showed widening cracks between the members, revealing the record company didn't know what to do and we never had a discussion about it because there wasn't much we could change. When we toured Big Game, I had my own dressing room. I was tired of the other guys, or maybe just Vito, he'd say. The band was given one more chance by the label to turn things around, releasing 1991's main attraction. But it was too little too late, as MTV had changed their format and were no longer playing hair metal bands. The album was a flop, not even landing in the top 40. Soon enough, White Lion would learn the hard way that the label was pulling support for the band. It was during the band's homecoming show in New York City that no one from the label bothered showing up. And Tramp would recall in the same interview. So the next day I went to Atlantic, the secretary doesn't know who I am. I say, can I speak to Doug Morris? And she says, oh, he's not available. And I said, just let him know Sebastian Bach is here. And a few minutes later, Doug Morris comes out and looks at me. I just turned around and walked out. I knew the song, There's a New Kid in Town. The band would soldier on for a few more shows, but they would break up in 1992. White Lion would re-emerge in 1999, as Tramp would resurrect the group with an all-new lineup, releasing the album Remembering White Lion, which featured new versions of the band's hit songs. In the years that followed, Tramp and Vita would be embroiled in legal headaches over who owns the name of the band, and tours would be cancelled after legal action threatened live shows. But it appears in 2010 the dispute over the name was settled, as Vito Brada now owns control over the group's name, forcing Tramp to keep playing as a solo act. A reunion with the pair seems unlikely given that Brada has virtually disappeared and rarely gives interviews. He did recently speak to Eddie Trunk where he revealed that he spent his off years caring for his ill father, and recently suffered a hand injury that impaired his ability to play guitar. So that does it for today's video guys, thanks for watching, and we'll see you again next time on Rock and Roll Stories, take care.